Going Linux Screencast number 6 Using Audacity for Advanced Audio Editing Welcome to this Going Linux Screencast. I'm your host, Larry Bushy. Going Linux Screencasts are produced by the Going Linux team as part of the Going Linux podcast. In screencasts number one and two, Tom and I discussed using Audacity to record and edit a podcast. In this episode, I have prepared a tutorial for fellow podcaster Nightwise of nightwise.com on how to use some of the advanced editing features of Audacity for editing multi-track audio recordings. Hello Nightwise, Larry Bushy of the Going Linux Podcast here. I am responding to your voice message, thanks very much for sending it, requesting some information with a little more detail as to how we here at the Going Linux Studios, that being my home, uh, record and produce our audio podcast using Linux, Linux tools, including Audacity and others, and only Linux. You mentioned that your current workflow for single track recordings includes Audacity already, but for multi track recordings, you are currently using GarageBand on the Mac, and you'd like to experiment a little bit with sliding across platforms a little bit more and see if you can do some multi track recording using. Audacity on Linux. So what I thought I would do is record this brief screencast with some information that is actually a little more in depth on how we use Audacity than we originally recorded uh, in the screencasts that we did a number of uh, years ago on how to use Audacity. We've learned a lot about how to use Audacity and how to edit and produce audio since then, and so I'd like to share some of the things that we have learned as well as the tools that we use. So first of all, of course, is Audacity itself. So you can see here I have moved a few things around from the standard to make it a little easier for me to do my workflow. And just to walk you through some of the things that we use, uh, Audacity is uh, here. We also use a tool here called EasyTag. Now we've used EasyTag for quite some time. Uh, what this little tool does is it allows you to add ID3 tags as well as album art to your finished files. But we're getting way ahead of ourselves. Uh, at this point, we haven't even recorded anything, let alone made an MP3 or an AUG of it. The other tools we use, of course, are FileZilla to, uh, to upload the files to the various uh, places they need to go once they're completed, and our audio edit, our, excuse me, our uh, website editing tool, Composer. We still use all of those same tools we have always used. Now, you mentioned as well that you use a tool called the Levelator. And what the Levelator normally does for um, audio recordings is it balances out uh, the very loud signals and the very low signals and acts as kind of a compressor, if you will. And it also uh, smooths out some of the noise, gets rid of noise and other things. So I actually do that manually using a series of plugins that are actually part of Audacity. Now, Audacity itself comes with a number of plugins uh, that I that I use. First of all, the very first one I use is the noise removal tool. The noise removal tool actually takes a sampling of the noise from the recording that you've made and removes it. That's the very first thing that I do. Uh, I don't do any other processing of the recording until I have removed the background noise. And I'll show you why we do that in just a moment. Uh, the next thing that I will do is I will go and use a plugin that does not come with Audacity out of the box. It is an add-on noise gate. 
This is something new that I have uh, added to the workflow since the original recording, and I'll describe how I use that. And then the very final process is a compressor, and there is a compressor built in here. So with those three plugins, the noise removal tool, the uh, noise gate, and the compressor, those things do all of the things that the levelator does without having to run Windows. They are three additional steps, but in using these tools, you have much more control over what your actual settings are. The levelator just does it with whatever the preset settings are. Certainly very convenient, but for us geeks, that is just not the way to go. You want to be able to tweak and twist the knobs and turn the dials, and you want to be able to set the settings the way you want them and make the software work for you rather than the other way around. I've heard that somewhere before. I don't recall where, but anyway, moving right along. So as we do our recording, I'm just going to record my voice here for a few moments as I'm talking. And you can see that I'm recording in stereo. I don't have a stereo mic set up as I normally do. I'm actually traveling right now. So I'm using a USB headset that's mono. Uh, and it's recording both sides. What we normally do, though, is we record my studio microphone passed through a mixer on channel one. That's the top channel here. And then I record sounds coming out of my computer sound card here on channel two. That allows me to have my nice clear signal here with the studio mic and a backup recording of the Skype conversation that I'm having with Tom and with Bill, my co-hosts. And by doing that and using it this way, I actually take it the I take advantage of the fact that when you record from your uh, audio sound card a, a Skype recording, you are actually recording just the far end of that conversation. I, it doesn't pick up my voice, so I've automatically got separation of channels there. So let's just stop this recording for a moment so that I can show you how we do our signal processing. All right, so moving back to the very beginning here. The first thing that I do is uh, I pull in recordings from Tom and from Bill. And so uh, I would just import them in, import audio, and here's Bill's audio from episode 194. Let's just bring that in. And you can see that that's coming in here. This isn't really going to make for a very good podcast because Bill's talking about some things that uh, we're not talking about here. So, And you can see it's a much longer recording. Let's just cut this down so that we have two recordings that are about the same size here. Okay, so there we go. We are now looking at an audio recording here. And it goes on for a little bit. There is some of Bill in here. Yes, there he is, and it goes on for a little bit longer as well. Okay, so now we've got two raw recordings, and let me move up here and show you how to separate the stereo track into mono. So it, it, I'm going to take stereo left and right and make it into two separate mono tracks. So by clicking the title uh, of the track, you can slide down to where it says split stereo to mono, and now I have two, in this case, identical tracks, but when we're actually recording, it would be my voice in mono on the upper channel, and in the second channel, it would be uh, the Skype recording out of my sound card and then this last one here is Bill speaking to me and recorded by Bill on his computer and so it is a much clearer uh, audio than it would be if I were to use the track that comes out of my sound card because of course I'm recording the sound out of uh, 
Skype rather than uh, directly from his microphone. So I would at this point line up both tracks here. So if this were actually uh, the recording as we would normally do it, this would be Bill's voice here as recorded by Skype, and this would be Bill's voice here as recorded uh, in our um, in his studio rather. And so uh, I would line the two up. I would take this off of. Uh, sync the tracks and I would then use this tool right here that allows me to move this track independently of the others so that it would line up with his voice here. So we have about the same timing. The timing isn't absolutely critical. You don't have to get it to the second or the millisecond, uh, but you do have to get it so that it is somewhere near you know, the conversation that you are having. Otherwise, uh, I will say hello and there will be a long pause and Bill will say hello several seconds later. That's not what you want, of course. So lining up the tracks is quite easy. Uh, then what I do, once I have them lined up, I delete the poor quality track and now I'm left with the tracks that I actually want to work with. Okay, that's step number one. Step number two, let's put our first tool into action. So you had mentioned to me that you are using the envelope tool, which is this one here, to do some of the manipulation of the audio waveform. I don't actually use that. Um, or perhaps this is the envelope tool. Either way, I don't use it. Uh, what I do is, though, uh, you can see here that in Bill's recording, there is a signal here. There's a very slight signal here, some what appears to be silence in between. And if I scroll over to the right, you can see here where he's talking a little bit. And so what I would do at this point is I would go into each of these tracks and switch it from waveform to waveform decibel or db and you can see that the display has changed here's the one before i've changed it's actually in amplitude from zero to one and if the signal was actually peaking it would go and hit right to the top here and uh, when you're talking about db this is where i've learned that i would like to work and i like to work viewing the decibels because that's how the filters display things and I find it's just a little bit easier to relate how the filters and the plugins are working when I'm using uh, DB as my display so let's switch bills to DB as well and now you can see much more clearly let me go back here this is something that I learned very um, important that I learned here and you can see that if I switch to the normal waveform, this area of Bill's recording looks like silence. And if you listen to it, and I put my track on mute for a moment, and you actually play this and listen to it, you can't really hear it, but you can see on the meter here that there is actually some noise in the background. And when you switch to the DB display, you can see what that noise looks like. It makes that stand out tremendously. And you can actually see here that uh, there's a little uh, higher amplitude blip here too. So when we're doing the recording, just so that each track, mine, Bill's, Tom's, has a section that I can rely on for, record, for having silence, I ask all three of us, to record silence at the same time. Now we don't want to mute our microphones because that would remove any of the background noise by virtue of the fact that we're using the mute function. So what we will do is we will actually not speak and we actually hold our breath so that there's no background noise other than the sound of our computer's fans or the air conditioning or the heater that's going. And so that allows me to take that noise out. So let me show you how we do that using the plugin. So on Bill's signal here, let's just take a little snippet here that we know is noise and we'll just uh, play it here. I know you may not be able to hear too much. Uh, let me mute that again. I don't know whether this is going to come through on the GTK Record My Desktop audio. 
but if I play it, you can see the meter moving in this little segment of uh, sound that we've picked up. Now, first plug in Effect, Menu, and then choose Noise Removal. Now, what we want to do at first is we want to get a sampling of that noise. That's what this button is for, Get Noise Profile. This records this little highlighted segment here as the noise sample. And so now I want to remove that noise from his entire track, wherever it appears. And you'll see what happens when I do that in this little visible segment here. So let me select his whole track. I do that by clicking over here on the left. Let's go back to the Effect menu. Go back to Noise Removal. And at this point, it allows me to make some adjustments as to how much noise I'm actually going to remove. I find that the default settings seem to be quite fine, and we're going to reduce noise by 24 dB. You can see that uh, that's why I've chosen the dB scale to display uh, our audio profile here. And the sensitivity at zero, frequency smoothing at 150, and attack decay time at 0.15 and we want to remove the noise. These are all the default settings that come with the noise removal tool built into Audacity. So I click OK and since this is a very short recording it takes just a fraction of a second but now you can see that we actually have true silence and these little blips I haven't heard what they are at this point but I do know they are Bill doing something and uh, with very low amplitude like this it may just be a creak in his headset or perhaps he's moved his chair or something like that so now if I go and play this from the beginning I can hear Bill talk and now you watch the meter there's no sound except where there's actually some noise so that's step one noise removal very important step. I would do that with my track up here as well, except that I don't think I recorded any silence. So let me go display the whole thing. I think the closest thing to silence would be right in here. So let's take a look at that. Yes, we have some silence or something close to it. Let's play that. Yeah, it sounds I don't hear anything, so I'm sure that's silence. But you can see from the meter that it peaks here up at uh, whatever this is in dB. Uh, one thing you can do is you can stretch this meter out to see the scale a little bit more. And if I actually make this full screen, I can stretch it out even more. And now I can see that the noise here is at about minus 48 dB. Okay, so let's remove this noise from my voice track as well. Effect, I want to take a new sample of the noise from my track, this little segment here. Select the whole track, Effect menu, Noise Removal, and OK. And now you can see that it didn't take all of the noise out, probably because this wasn't actually uh, a completely silent bit. I may have been taking a breath or something like that. So it didn't actually remove the entire thing, but we'll take care of that with another filter in a moment. Okay, so now for both tracks we have taken out the noise. Now if we were to listen to the tracks it would sound much quieter uh, and it, uh, if you have a fan in the background, the fan is gone, but it hasn't done anything to the voice the, uh, the speaking itself. Okay, the next thing that we want to do is, let's see, I said that I use the noise gate. Before I show you how to use, how to use the noise gate, let me show you how to get the noise gate. If you go to the Audacity website and go to their download tab, so this is audacity.sourceforge.net, and then click on the download tab, you'll see that there's a link here to plugins and libraries. And there are a number of these that you can choose to install. Also, somewhere on their uh, 
in uh, their wiki, their manual, if you will. There is a manual for this online. Uh, it will give you instructions on how to install the plugins that you uh, will uh, download from here. So you can search through here and get the various plugins, uh, and you can get them from various locations as well. But the one that we're using here is this noise gate. And I copied and pasted into a text file because I could never remember every time I want to try out a new plugin, how do you install it? I don't remember where it goes because it's different on Windows and on Linux and maybe even on the Mac. They're different on those platforms. So uh, I copied this from their manual, how do I install plugins on Linux? And in this case, the LADSPA or LADPSA plugins, L-A-D-P-S-A plugins, uh, go into USR slash share slash audacity slash plugins. Uh, if it was installed from a repository package on Linux. So if you installed it on Mint or Ubuntu from the repository, that's where the plugins go. Otherwise, if you installed it yourself or you compile it, uh, compiled it from source code, it will be in the USR slash local slash share slash audacity, audacity slash plugins folder. So all you have to do is take the file and I've put it in this folder here called NoiseGate. I take this .ny file, the NoiseGate.ny file, and drop it into that folder. And then restart Audacity, and now you will have indeed your plugin installed. Now, how do I use that? Okay. So what I actually want to do, I'm going to stretch this out a little bit so that I can see this noise a little bit better on the dB scale on the left-hand side. You really don't have to do this, but I want to show you this. These little bits of noise here, let's say they're very annoying. Maybe these are uh, me popping my peas or maybe just my lips smacking as I take a breath or something like that or my chair creaking. That's something that really happens during our recordings. So, and I want to re remove these, or I want to remove the worst of them at least. So I've got this going on in the background here, uh, and I want to remove these. Well, this is about, what's that look like? Maybe minus 50 dB. Certainly this is minus 48 right here. That would take it all out. Maybe this little peak would still be there. Uh, but certainly if I went up to minus 36 dB and took out everything that's below that, that's going to do this for me. Now, let's use this plugin to do some analysis here as opposed to guessing using this uh, scale over here on the left-hand side. Let's again highlight the thing that we want as a sample. And now let's go into our effect, our plugin, and select the noise gate. Okay, much like our noise removal tool, the noise gate will act on a sample and analyze that sample. It's not just going to record it and remove everything in that sample. Uh, so in that way, it's unlike the noise removal tool. It's a little bit different. So what we're going to do is we're going to change this function selector here and ask it to analyze the noise level first. And if I click OK, what it does now is it analyzes that selected segment and says that this is based on the first half second. And it looks like I've chosen about a second, a little more than a second here. So it's actually using just this first part. And its threshold setting is minus 33 dB. That's telling you that's the setting you need, you need to use if you want to remove all of what is here in this half second segment. And if you look at it, you can see that takes care of this peak right here. And if this is indeed noise, that's exactly what I want to do. So again, I would remove everything below that noise threshold uh, using this noise gate from the entire signal here. So let's just zoom out a little bit so you can see a little better what the effect is. 
I'll zoom in a little bit more. So we're looking at this section right here. And what we say is, or what we're interested in, is the actual talking and not this background noise right here. So I've selected the whole track. I'm now going to go into Effect, go into the plugin, go into the noise gate. Remember, this is what I always forget, remember to take it off of Analyze and actually have it do the gating. Now, if you remember, we said that we wanted the gate threshold set at minus 33 dB. So we go and we can use the slider or we can type it in as I've just done here. Now these other settings, uh, very interesting. So frequencies above this level, I don't have any that I want to uh, gate above that level, so uh, zero is fine. Now, level reduction. This is how much will the noise be reduced. So we're taking anything that's minus 33 and we're going to reduce it by minus 12 dB. I can increase the amount of reduction or increase the noise gate uh, here by changing this level value here. I found that this one works for most of what I want to do. Now the attack decay time here in milliseconds simply um, adjusts how quickly it responds to the difference between voice and what we've determined to be the noise that we want to gate out. And 250, I don't honestly remember whether that's the default or whether that's the one that I had settled on as kind of the one I want to use as my default. But certainly the setting that you're going to change in this gate is how much uh, gate threshold are you going to be using? And you can use that analyzer to figure that out. Okay, so now if we click OK, let me just move this out of the way here so you can see what it looked like before. Let it process. And now you can see what it looks like after. And what it's done here that's different from the noise removal is this. In the fan noise scenario, you want to use noise removal because you want to remove that fan noise even during the times when you're talking. And that noise removal tool will take that constant repetitive noise out of the entire uh, audio track. And so the difference now with a noise gate is, is it just says that anything that is below minus 33 in amplitude uh, or in dB here, let's just completely drive that down. Well, we didn't say to zero, we said reduce it by 12 dB, an additional 12 dB to make it even quieter. And that does not have any impact on signal above that threshold level. In other words, it doesn't touch the speech at all, as opposed to the noise removal tool, which does touch the speech areas. And one of the things you'll notice with the noise removal tool is if the noise is very loud uh, or isn't very constant, it varies a little bit, like it's someone speaking in the background and you try to remove that with a noise removal tool, uh, you will end up with a, a sound when when you're listening to the people actually talking that you want to hear, and it will sound like a robotic voice. It will sound a very wavery, uh, very poor audio quality, and that's when you use the noise removal tool. But using the gate, the noise gate, it's actually going to leave the speech alone that's above the threshold you've set and reduce or remove the noise below that threshold. Uh, so there's the difference there. Okay, last step here. Uh, last step for me is to again select, well, we've got two tracks here, so I would actually go in and gate out any noise here on Bill's track as well. And um, if there were some areas like this area here that didn't actually get gated out and I want to actually drive them to zero, I would select that and use this little tool right here, silence, 
to uh, make that zero. So that actually removes all of the noise right there. All right, now the last bit, the compressor. This is the part that um, the levelator does for you. Actually, the levelator does some of what we were just talking about here, except you have no control over the settings, like I said earlier. But now let's look at compressor. Okay, so we select the whole track again because I want to compress the whole thing and I select effect and compressor. Now this little tool is built into Audacity by default and it has a number of sliders here that are very intimidating. So again, this is the threshold and if I adjust this left and right, watch the graph, you can see that it moves left and right as well. And so what this is doing is determining where the threshold is that we want to compress the the audio. And compression here is simply uh, a technique used to make the loud sounds, uh, maintain the loud sounds at the um, loudness that you perceive and make the soft sounds come up in apparent volume. So make the uh, whispers, if you will, much more audible because you're compressing the dynamic range of the audio. And so it sounds like the whispers are just as loud as um, a yell, for example, except that uh, you can tell that it's a yell because someone speaks differently when they're yelling than when they're whispering. But uh, for someone listening on speakers, ah, there you are online nightwise, very nice, perfect appearance. Okay. So now we have uh, that threshold and the noise floor. Okay, so this can do a little bit of uh, noise gating here as well. And the ratio, what's the ratio that you want to, um, uh, let me go back to noise floor, I said that wrong. So noise floor is what do you uh, consider noise and let's not uh, consider anything below that level. So minus 40 dB. I might want to uh, make this minus 33 or something like that to conform with what we looked at on the noise gate, but that's not absolutely necessary. So the ratio is, uh, what's the ratio that you want to actually apply to the compression? A four to one ratio is okay. And if I uh, move this slider, you can see that, uh, you know, a, a larger amount of compression ratio is, is going to have a little different effect than a smaller amount. I found that four to one works fine for uh, our voices and I usually leave it set on there but you can actually increase or decrease the amount of compression uh, that you want to apply. Now be careful you apply too much compression and it's going to sound bad and you apply too little compression and it's not going to make any difference. Again attack time is how quickly do you want it to respond on uh, the front end of uh, the compression, and after it's completed the compression, how quickly do you want it to decay off? And this last little checkbox here is makeup gain for zero dB after compressing. This is kind of like normalizing. Uh, so when you're done, if this checkbox is checked, it's going to make your highest peak volume at zero dB or thereabouts. So uh, I usually like to leave that clicked as well. So again, let's take a look at what happens to our waveform when we do that. You can see that it did change a little bit here. Some of the um, uh, higher amplitudes got higher and uh, we don't have anything that's really low in volume so you really didn't see too much of a change there. Let's apply that to bills as well. Compressor, same settings and you can see much different effect on his. You can see that some of the background noise from his fan and some other stuff going on actually uh, increased here as well. And this is where if these become audible uh, in the signal, I'll go in, especially over where someone else is talking, where I'm talking or where Tom is talking uh, and Bill is not saying anything, I'll make that absolute zero here so that it just comes out a little crisper and a little cleaner. So all of this takes a little bit more time, actually it takes a lot more time uh, than using the levelator, 
but as you can see, you have a lot more control. And as you're actually doing this, you'll find that, uh, especially when you're recording your own voice most of the time, you'll have the settings set. Your background noise will be the same from recording session to recording session, and so you won't have to actually change them uh, all that much unless something changes in your environment. So the actual process for you won't take much longer than using the levelator. You simply go in, click, remove the noise, go back in, click, use the noise gate, and final step, go back in and use the compression tool. So I will use all of those after I've edited down the podcast. In other words, I will, well, I might use the noise removal tool right up front on the unedited audio. But uh, I would then edit down the stuff that we don't want. I take that out. Uh, I'll move things around in the audio so that, uh, you know, take out the pauses and a couple of the ums and the ahs and some of the inappropriate jokes and things like that. Uh, and then I will do the um, the noise gate and the compression on that final uh, final audio, simply because that processing does take a little bit of time, and I find that uh, the length of the audio, if, if we're recording what ends up as an hour-long podcast, it might have taken us an hour and a half or two hours to record it with all the kibitzing and stuff that goes on. So uh, that's it for uh, editing and recording. Now, uh, what else do we do here? I mentioned that we use the um, uh, ID3 tag, uh, special software for adding ID3 tags. But let me be quite upfront, I actually do that in Audacity as well. So I have a metadata editor right here on Audacity. It's built in. So I select that. And you may have noticed that when you save a file, or export a file rather, it pops this up. And you can fill in a bunch of stuff. You can even add tags, if you will. These are your ID3 tags. I have actually saved a template for our going Linux. It saves it as XML. And so I have the ID3 tags all pre-selected here. And I just type in the episode number and put in the topic, and the episode number goes down here as well. And now when I export this, I can actually save this with my project here so that as I export, it's going to export those ID3 tags as well. So let's just do that. So we're going to select File, Export. Now, Og Vorbis, I use a setting of two. This gets somewhere near 196 kilobits in size, and the quality is about the same quality as, uh, well, actually, it's a little better quality than a 196 kilobit, the same number of sampling size uh, on an MP3 file. So let's just export it as that, and we will take this. Let's just put it on my desktop for now, and we'll call it audio test file. Okay, and we'll save it as an AUG file. It presents this in case I want to edit any of those again. There we go. Very short doesn't take long to record it and export it at all. And then what I would do at this point, I would record, uh, export rather the other two formats. I would switch this to MP3, and I would go here and take the 96, I said 196 earlier, it's 96 kilobits that I was talking about. I would record the MP3 uh, file as a 96 kilobit, and then I would go back and, re and uh, export it as a 64 kilobit for the bandwidth impaired. Okay, I'm not going to take the time to do that now. So we're finished with Audacity. Uh, save the changing, save the changes, no. We'll get rid of this. And so now here is our AUG file. Next step in the process is I want to use the Easy Tag tool. I want to look at the 
uh, file on my desktop. Here it is. You can see here are the ID3 tags that it brought over. And it brought over almost everything. Everything looks just fine. I want to actually add in a URL. Show notes dot going Linux dot com so that you can find them. I can add comments and other stuff here. But now here's where the magic happens for album art. You select the pictures tab and I now have under the going Linux folder here under pictures I have album art and I use the large album art in PNG format and there it is ready to go I save this do you want to write the tags yes of course I do there we go and so now we close this and now this has not only ID3 tags, but also it has the album art right there in it. And now I publish these. It's ready to go. So that's all there is to it, Nightwise. Uh, hopefully that helps you out. And uh, you can complete your cross-platform sliding from using a Mac for multi-track recording and pushing that over to a Linux-based platform for doing the same thing. Good luck, and let us know how it goes. The music provided by Mark Blasco at podcastthemes.com.